This is Just Asking Questions, a show for inquiring minds on reason. When you elect me to this office, I promise to always level with you, to tell you the truth. How truthful has the Biden administration been? Just asking questions. This past month has been one of the most tumultuous in modern American political history. A devastating face plant in a televised presidential debate, an attempted assassination of an ex-president favored to win re-election, a COVID infection of the sitting president and subsequent exit from the race, and an endorsement and loads of money pouring into the campaign of a previously unpopular vice president. What was going on behind the scenes that led us to this moment? Liz Wolf and I have invited on to the show one of the best working political journalists out there to help us better understand that. Alex Thompson writes about the Biden White House for Axios. He's had a number of scoops about the internal goings on in the Biden White House, despite the fact that according to our previous guest, Dave Weigel, he's been pushed away for his previous reporting on Biden's condition. We hope to talk with him a little bit more about that in a bit. But first, thank you for joining us today, Alex. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, you set expectations high. I usually try to go in with low expectations. <laughs> I, I, I have confidence in you. And I want to start uh, by talking uh, about the way in which Biden dropped out. He posted this letter to X.com. Let me pull it up. There. Oh, yeah, pull that up first, John. Um, and which... Uh, I've been told for years now is an untrustworthy disinformation hub. Uh, and then a few minutes later to Facebook, and then he dropped an endorsement of Kamala Harris as his successor, and then went radio silent for several days before calling into a Harris press event. And then finally he gave a speech yesterday. To me, it's emblematic of the opaque and kind of reclusive way this administration has operated for much of the past several years. What's your understanding of why it unfolded in this bizarre way, Alex? Yeah, I completely agree. And the, the opaqueness sort of led to conspiracies. Biden is dead. Uh, yeah. Jill forced him to sign the letter. You know, it was an auto sign uh, away of the presidency, all of that. You know, my, this is my, you know, listening to the speech last night, you could tell that it was very sad. And you could tell also with the way that his family reacted, his granddaughter, Finnegan, who was in the room, uh, cried afterwards, Ashley and Hunter were there, Jill was there. Um, it was like a very sad moment. And part of the reason I think it was bad, I, I, you know, I, I, Joe Biden, make no mistake, Joe Biden did this reluctantly. This was not, a decision Joe Biden wanted to make. I think he made that very clear in the weeks after this debate performance. And, you know, and, and part of this is because Joe Biden's self mythology, his self narrative, is very much one of resiliency, of never quitting. And this was, you know, one of the first times I, you know, in his life, and certainly the most high stakes time of his life, where he quit. And it was, and and he was sort of forced to because of the writing on the wall, the party. The party decided, you know, as some political scientists say, and the party includes um, donors, including Nancy Pelosi, included Chuck Schumer, and that's uh, that. That's I think where 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 we were. And I think you know, I don't, I have not talked to people that were the closest. Um, you know, the people that are closest to Joe Biden basically said that this was not. You know, Joe Biden doesn't often decide; he evolves. You know, and he takes a long time to get to a decision. And once the writing was on the wall, it finally became clear and it and it set in. Um, and that's why he did it. But, you know, other people that have known Joe Biden for a long time, you know, they said, you know, he was embarrassed. Uh, you know, he was he was sort of humiliated to exit this race. And um, and he was all and I think that was part of the reason why we didn't see him for a bit. In addition to the fact that he he was actually sick. Um, you know, his, his campaign chair, Jenna Malley Dillon, in an internal call with the campaign staff that, a re, uh, you know, I, I obtained a recording of, said um, that when she talked to him last Friday, he, quote, sounded like shit. Um, and, you know, he was actually sick. So I think the combination of that was uh, his both emotion, his emotions and his health was why we didn't see him for a bit. And I also think 
um, you know, that self narrative is why last night beach sounded so sad. We spoke with Dave Weigel recently, and one thing that he suggested to us uh, was that you were pushed out of Biden's sort of inner circle of reporters who had substantial access to him for the crime of noticing that Biden is old and that there might be cognitive decline at play and the fact that you were reporting on this honestly because you are a journalist and so that is your job. What was that experience like? Um, you know, it was a bit... Uh isolating i mean i didn't really care so much about you know like the acts like the sucking up for access thing i mean a like n none of the people that suck up for access in this white house really get anything good anyway so it, it just it, like, sometimes you do play like i'm happy to play the suck up game if uh you know it, the but like in this white house the biggest suck ups it's not like they get like any huge amazing scoops anyway so i just never really played that game in part because they knew I was never going to play it as well as some others anyway. <laughs> um, the the thing that the thing that was sort of distinct about it was it was occasionally very isolating. Um, the White House, you know, every White House, I think, at least according to like books and histories I've read, you know, every White House tries to sort of trash talk reporters to, you know, to the other reporters, try to pit reporters against each other. Um, I think what was distinct about this experience though was I didn't feel there was not as much solidarity with reporters as there was perhaps during the Trump years when I feel like even if you trash talk Jim Acosta you know like people would still have Jim Acosta's back you know at least in, in some ways and in some ways I, I did feel the fact that there was you know like one one example was you know I, I re-report you know the, the day after the debate I put in my story that Biden is dependably engaged between 10 and 4, and then, um, you know, sometimes outside those hours, he is less dependably tired. Which has become a meme at this point, right? Like you breaking that piece of information has now made it so that people routinely will say, oh, well, hopefully, you know, Israel and Iran will be sure to conduct all of their, uh, you know, matters between, you know, at, at around noon Eastern time, right? Yes. But the thing about that is I reported that first last April and in 2023. But it didn't, you know, it, it was not followed. There was not like that. Like you can go back and it was like Biden is running against his age in 2024. And they're just, um, you know, there was one follow to it that the New York Times did a big swing on Joe Biden's age, which, you know, also similar to me, uh, you know, uh, and that, like did an analysis of his schedules and found that he did far fewer events later at night. But it didn't break through in the same way because the White House was very good. Like, and I give the credit, you know, the comms team was good. They they basically filled that story with a lot of, well, Trump had executive time, right? And Trump Trump's schedule was all over the place as well, which are all true things. But at the time, I was surprised because, yeah, at the time, Trump wasn't even the nominee yet. You know, Trump, Trump was the previous president, but... Uh, you know, it felt like they were they, they, they were allowing Biden to be graded on a Trump curve, um, which, you know, even though it, which su surprised me, I, 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 I'll say. But so, you know, the you the, the the question you were asking was, you know, how was the experience? And it did sometimes feel isolating in that way, because I, you know, in the last month, I've had a number of reporters sort of come up to me and be like, Oh yeah, man! Like the White House was really trashing you. To, you know, uh, or the, yeah. Could you us, just like, tell us a little bit? Could you tell us a little bit more about what actually happened? Um, like, how how did it all unfold? Because I assume it was stories like this, which we put up a second ago. This was from mm -hmm. uh, April, uh, where you're talking about Biden changing his walking routine to Marine One, so that people it's not as visible. The kind of stiffness of his gait, just the the general yes. Biden is in decline before it was okay to talk about that and openly acknowledge it. What what were the mechanics? How were you actually pushed out and did were people direct about it? Was it sort of indirect thing? Well, you know, I, I sort of um you know, and certainly people weren't made available. People would yeah. I remember one time 
uh, I was on my way to a coffee with uh, a former administration official and they just sort of abrupt, like I was literally in the car driving and then they, uh, they abruptly just canceled, you know, and said, I don't think that this is going to be worth my time. It feels like you're in bad faith, which, um, you know, like, and but I really wasn't at doing it in bad faith. I was trying to, you know, I was just trying to, or what was true. And, you know, sometimes people are like Biden defenders and I, I, I try to get coffee with all of them. Like I, it wasn't the, the thing that was sort of strange about it too, is there was this, they, they pushed it as like, um, you know, this is like Biden enemy number one or like a Biden hater. And, uh, that was never my goal or my mission or how I thought about it. I, I really, and, it, and I didn't like being labeled that way. Um, because that wasn't really what I was trying to do. Uh, like I, I always thought of myself as aggressive and adversarial as you should be with anyone in power. Anyone in power should be scared. I basically thought my mission is anyone that's in power should be scared of doing something or should be scared that I'm going to find out what they're doing. Like they should be like every single time they think about making decisions, like, well, what did Alex find out about this? Or like, what if the press finds out about this? Like to make it less, uh, about me and yeah. that's how I thought about it and I, I I think it was it was strange to be labeled as like this antagonist um, when that was really I, I think you should always be adversarial with people in power but not bad face yeah I think you, is... that's a, that's exactly the type of journalism that we are hoping for uh, and that I mean honestly if people had taken it seriously and reacted a different way, maybe the Democratic Party wouldn't be in the position that it's in right now if there hadn't been this sense of denial and we can't talk about the obvious decline that is right in front of everyone's faces. Liz, you were going to say something? Oh, I was just going to say that like the idea of an adversarial press, I mean, this kind of used to be how most journalists, like the dominant mode of thinking about this among journalists. Do you have a sense, like, can you identify when this changed or went out of style uh you know i i can't speak for others i but i do i mean i, I think it i think it's just an objective reality the press is not as adversarial with biden as they were with trump now like the the people would say well that's because Biden doesn't deserve as as like adversarial as as much as trump they are very different and i do think also like you know, Trump's White House was more mendacious. They they did lie more. And, uh, you know, it, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't. I think some something that we forgot a little bit, though, is that just because they're not as as, uh, you know, mendacious doesn't mean they're not capable of lying. <laughs> you know, I think. Yeah. Um, so I don't I mean, like, clearly, clearly the press is not as adversarial with with Biden as with Trump. And obviously, they're two very different principles. They are. Um, and the level of adversarialness may not be merited to be the same, but, uh, I did feel that there was a huge, I thought, I always sort of felt there was not enough. I, 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 again, like I felt isolated because I didn't feel there was as much adversarial, uh, as many adversarial reporters on Biden. I want to ask about one of your recent stories, uh, over at Axios, this one right here, Scoop Biden doubted Harris's election chances. Kamala Harris is now presumed by many to be the nominee for the Democratic Party because Biden has endorsed her. A lot of money has flowed in. She seems to have gotten pledges from a lot of the delegates, although it's not obvious how I mean, that's not completely binding, so a lot could still happen between now and the convention. However, uh, I, I and I, I'm curious about that story. The, tell us a little bit more about some of the conversations that were happening within Biden's circle about the prospect of endorsing Kamala Harris as he exited the race. It was interesting because actually, like I wrote that story and I had a... It, you know, I turned it very quickly because I was already working on it before Biden dropped out. And originally the story was going to be the Kamala excuse um, as that, like the Biden team was arguing to people that 
uh, that were pushing him to drop out. Well, hey, like, uh, I have serious concerns about Kamala's ability to win, that she's maybe not as electable as me. Or, like, his advisors were also saying that to people. Like, hey, like, she's not as electable as me. And then all of a sudden he drops out. And then I was like, well, I, I have all this reporting. So, yeah, so they were they were concerned. Biden was concerned, felt that um, she, she, I think he, he at once privately put it, and this is in Chris Whipple's book about the Biden presidency. I think he called, Biden called Obama a work in progress the first two years. Um, and it was interesting. Um, I, I, and the point of the piece really was to show, listen, like there's going to be this sugar high, right? You have a candidate that can speak, you know, eloquently, uh, you know, beyond what certainly Biden is capable of doing. But her vice presidency has been rocky. And there was a reason why a report, like reported reason why Biden and his aides were worried. Now, some of that was in their self-interest to be worried, right? Like they, like, you know, obviously you're going to say, well, she can't win because that also means like I have to stay. But also, you know, like for, for one, one stat for you. So about half of the, of the vice president's office is paid for by the Senate given that the vice president's president of the Senate and, um, and as a result, those have, those staff have to be disclosed. So of the 47 staff that were with her, her first year, um, that were disclosed, only five are still there. Um, contrast that to the same period of time when Joe Biden was vice president of the 37 that started, uh, 17 or 18, I'm going to misremember, but like basically half of the staff was still there uh, by this point in the first Obama term. So she had tremendous staff turnover. People felt that she ran away from responsibility and, and she turned, you know, she just turned through an enormous amount of staff. Yeah. There's, there's a bit of a hype cycle around Kamala Harris right now. And she is getting a bump in the polls because she's the new exciting candidate but I, I wonder how sustainable that is. And I also, frankly, do wonder how certain her being the nominee is. There's this factor of Obama not expressly endorsing her. her. How significant is that? So two things. The, the bigger thing why she's almost certainly going to be the nominee is not, you, you already went through, like there there is still abilities for her not to be i mean it's not very hard to challenge her i think you need just like a few hundred signatures the problem is that everyone that could potentially challenge her has already endorsed her so the like it's really more of like a who question um the obama endorsement is very interesting um i'm not i don't know exactly i know there's been some reporting that he's upset you know in, in the new york post i, I don't know i can't confirm that um Obama has often wanted to sort of be like the last stamp. Um, and so he was always going to be the last one. Um, that being said, you know, there were already, uh, you know, Nancy Pelosi had sort of made clear to other people that she preferred an open process, you know, a, a sort of blitz primary or closed primary. Others like Jim Clyburn made it clear that he wanted it to be Harris. Uh, right away. So there were clearly disagreements within the party um, at, the, at the highest level over whether or not uh, it should be Kamala or not. But once Biden endorsed Harris, um, you know, the most important thing is that meant that she almost certainly, now there's been a legal town, but almost certainly inherit the, the, his cash, right? Like it's $100 million in hard money that they, that they raised. Um, and so if you have that, you know, it gives her such a distinct advantage over anyone that would potentially challenge her besides like a billionaire, like the Illinois governor, J.B. Pritzker. So this week we've seen the development of uh, a little bit of a Kamala Harris political liability uh, in the form of the border. You know, we saw a whole bunch of headlines from, you know, mainstream, normal, reputable publications around 2021 and pretty much since then calling her the border czar. Um, obviously, that's an informal term. It's not that people are actually appointed czars in any administration, but it is what we you know, routinely refer to a person tasked with handling that type of thing. And 
Kamala was sort of set up for what seems like an impossible task from Biden. And under her watch, um, I guess it's a little bit up in the air how much you want to attribute it to her leadership. Border apprehensions uh, reached their record high at the very end of 2023. So now there's a little bit of this funny about face that's going on where, I mean, even your own publication, Axios, today or yesterday uh, had a new updated headline, Harris border confusion haunts her new campaign. And there's a little bit of this, this sense throughout a lot of the reporting, including Axios's own reporting, though obviously not bylined by you, that uh, it was really kind of a Republican talking point to attach the border czar title to her. And really, perhaps she shouldn't be held particularly responsible for what's gone on at the border. What do you make of this? Is this an example of media malpractice? Is this an example of um, the public not understanding the role? Like, what exactly is going on here? Okay, so a few things. One is, um, you know, my colleague, Steph Kite, who wrote that story that you just put up there, um, has been as tough on on Biden and Harris and the border as anyone. We co-bylined a story that people can look up. Literally, the byline is, the headline is how Biden botched the border. And we wrote mm -hmm. that together. So um, I just want to, you know, yeah. put in, a, you know, she got, she got uh, dunked on on social media yesterday. She's like an amazing reporter. So um, so separate from that, though, the, this whole borders are like we're, we're getting sort of lost in like the title, like the, the title nuances and I understand why. Um, but like he, this is this is this is basically what happened is that Biden and the administration, the White House basically presented her as like she was going to it's not just northern tribal countries, but she was going to deal with northern tribal countries and Mexico to deal with migration across the border. Mm -hmm. And then once it um, and they presented it that way, like they like the reason why the headlines were so, um, you know, strong about, well, she's going to deal with the border at the beginning is because that's how the White House presents it in background calls and and publicly. But then it, then Harris's team, sensing the political peril of having this assignment, basically tried to uh, try to contain it. Um, tried to, in some ways, people in the administration felt run away uh, from responsibility. Um, and there's, if you go back and read that, how Biden botched the border story, there is like a searing quote from a senior administration official who talked to me that basically said it was a blown opportunity that, you know, um, you know, part of being vice president is that you get tough jobs. And, you know, Joe Biden, for what it's worth, when he was vice president, that first term, he had some really shitty jobs, um, you know, handling and, and, and arguably didn't do the greatest at them. But also, like, if you have a shitty job, it, there there's always political fallout. Like he handled the withdrawal from Iraq, the implementation of the of the stimulus package. Like and, and when ISIS, you know, when, when ISIS came up a few years later, like the Iraq withdrawal, like came under a lot of scrutiny. You had the Solyndra stuff. And when you're dealing with a stimulus package that big, there's always going to be problems uh, within it just inevitably. So, you know, Joe Biden, I think that's also what led to some resentment of her within the administration is especially given that Joe Biden took on, uh, you know, shitty jobs as vice president. They felt that she was running away from responsibility. But at the same time, you know, Har some people on Harris's team felt that Joe Biden's team did not want her to shine because they knew that it was going to be that like if if she shines then it would be a problem for his reelection because if she was a clear viable alternative then it would make it easier to sort of try to push him aside so that was another sort of factor going on in there but all of that all of that i think is really useful context but does it like what is the media's role this week in this I think we can call it a scandal at this point. I mean, I even see the New York Times headline from, I think, yesterday, why Republicans keep calling Kamala Harris the borders are. We saw a Time magazine headline, Kamala Harris was never Biden's borders are. Like, I'm sorry, but it feels like we're in a situation where mainstream media publications are further squandering the public trust because they're doing this uh, backpedaling seemingly at the White House's behest. Well, I'm not I'm not a media reporter, so I'm not gonna play media critic for you guys. But uh, I'm sorry, but but the you but I will say that closely, and it is a little bit. Yes. I mean, my hackles are raised as a fellow reporter here. Let, let, 
uh, listen, I think, I think it's very, regardless of the words borders are, the fact is mm-hmm. that Kamala Harris was responsible for a, 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 a significant slice of the Biden administration's migration policy. And when there are some things that the Biden team is not responsible for, like that couldn't control, for example, the, the, the crisis became more global in nature. Mm-hmm. Um, and that you see it across the world. But the thing is that when the crisis started to get worse and worse and more global, Kamala Harris continue, and her team continue to say, my responsibility is only Northern Triangle and Mexico. And like, you know, if you're dealing with a significant crisis and you are saying, but that's not my responsibility, that is certainly worth scrutiny and worth, you know, I, I think the, I think the, the Biden administration's record on the border is certainly even regardless if she was borders are is certainly something that she is responsible for. She's part of the administration and she also had a significant portfolio within the border or Alex, within migration uh, in we, the border. We're going to Liz and I are going to continue this conversation and look at some of the clips uh, from Kamala Harris's recent rally, as well as Joe Biden's uh, resi- or, uh, speech dropping out of the race. But I know that you uh, have to m- get moving soon. So before you leave, I wanted to ask you the question that we ask all of our guests in the spirit of the show, which is what's a question that you think more people should be asking? That's a good, that's a good, I, you know, I listened to you guys, but I didn't prep for this one. Um, I think, you know, the question I think, and this is, I'm actually stealing from some Biden sources. So some, (laughs) some, some Biden people that don't work in the White House anymore and haven't for a while, but like worked for Joe Biden for a long time, consider themselves like Biden loyalists that love Joe Biden, that that feel very strongly about his legacy. The thing that, that angers them the most is when did people closest to him notice debate Biden, for lack of a better term? Mm. Like really noted, like, and, and how aware were they? And if they were aware at all, then how did they let him go on the debate stage? if there was even a 5% chance that he was going to go up there on that stage and humiliate himself, how did they let him do it? And this is particularly like that inner, inner circle. So we're talking people, uh, yeah, obviously like first lady, Jill Biden, there was a lot of, I can tell you a lot of anger, you know, toward her because she obviously spent the most time with them or close to the most time with them. Then people like Mike Donnell and Steve Rochetti, Bruce Reed, um, Anthony Bernal, and Tom Cini, you know, if, if if you think there's any chance he's going to act like that on that debate stage, how do you let him go out there if you say you also love him? And I think getting more and more into how, how people noticed it, um, how his age and, you know, has affected his presidency and his decision making and how and like how it's affected the policy like what i think there's so much focus on how it's affected the horse race and then how voters didn't want to elect them you know but i always the reason i was always covering the age stuff was especially after he declared for reaction lists i was like you know this is gonna like what it's not just like can he win it's like what if he does win and you have you know this very old you know very very old man um it, you know, in this position of authority, and it's already affecting the presidency in this ways. So I think exploring, I think people should more and more explore how his age has already affected the presidency and how, you know, what people noticed and went. Yeah, those are great questions. And um, I'm glad that you and your 
uh, reporting has sort of has helped remove some of the taboo around these questions Absolutely. because it's these are questions we need to consider going forward as well when we're consider when we're looking at presidential candidates and kind of take the lessons of this administration seriously. Um, I really appreciate you joining us today, Alex, and I appreciate your work at Axios. Um, you can you know follow him on Twitter, find his work at Axios, and uh, we'll see you around. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Uh, this was really fun. I'm sorry I can't say the full the full time, but uh, next time. All right. Thanks, Alex. OK, so let's turn a little bit, Liz, towards Biden's exit speech, which he gave last night. And the part I want to get into first is him just talking about passing the torch to the next generation. Let's roll a little bit of that. My fellow Americans, I'm speaking to you tonight from behind the Resolute Desk in the Oval Office. When you elected me to this office, I promise to always level with you. To tell you- Hold on one sec, I just got a comment um, as a video producer here, the strange eye line. He's like, he, this is a, an incredibly important historic speech and his eye line is just like just so slightly off um so there's something that that bothers me about that on a technical also, level the um, curtains are ugly <laughs> like i'm sorry but do they have like an interior designer like what the hell yeah. we're also uh, about to get into how uh, truthful he's been um, this entire time and the truth the sacred cause of this country is larger than any one of us you know, in recent weeks, it's become clear to me that I need to unite my party in this critical endeavor. I believe my record as president, my leadership in the world, my vision for America's future, all merited a second term. But nothing, nothing can come in the way of saving our democracy. That includes personal ambition. So I've decided the best way forward is to pass the torch to a new generation. So he's uh, making the case there that, you know, he's he's doing the noble thing. He's putting aside his personal ambition and doing this for the Save good of democracy. democracy, not because he can't finish another four years, but because the peop the party elites and so forth have decided that he cannot win the election. Uh, what's your reaction to that? Uh, How is it democratic to force his party into this very difficult position? I mean, we are past the primaries, so electors have already attempted to transmit the will of the voters in their state, and they've already uh, pledged to vote for Joe Biden, and now they will be unable to do so. If only he could have possibly foreseen some of these issues earlier in the process. I mean, we've had presidents drop out of running for re-election uh, historically in March of an election year. I'm not sure why he couldn't have made this decision around the time of January, February, March. I'm not totally sure why it needed to happen in July. And also it's just completely disingenuous, right? Like it's anybody who's been following this story in the slightest way knows that he's just full of shit here. I mean, it's, it's stunning because it's like he has been claiming and all of the people ultra close to him have been claiming for the better part of the last month that he will not in fact be stepping down and that he still has what it takes. And that actually it was just a bad day. And it was just, it was the jet lag from traversing the world a few times that led to the poor debate performance. Never mind, of course, the fact that he didn't traverse the world. He went to like Los Angeles and France. Uh, and that happened 11 days prior to his debate performance. And he spent the entire week preceding the debate uh, you know, hunkered down and preparing for it and ostensibly recovering from the jet lag. I mean, it would make sense if he hadn't had this line that he failed to stick to, right? He yeah. was sort of attempting to pull the wool over our eyes and it became impossible to do so. And look, this is very sad. He seems like a beleaguered, tired old dude and I feel for him and this must be terribly humiliating. However, you don't just get to lie and have it be excused because people see you as this like you know, sort of like cuddly elder statesman type. No, you've been somebody who's been seeking political power for 50 years. You're not, you know, this like benevolent, heroic type figure. 
yeah, it's that's obviously how he is attempting to portray himself here. And I do agree with you, Liz, that it's ultimately very sad to watch. Um, yeah, I you feel know, that whether you supported him at any point or not, um, just seeing the president in that condition and and having and and in this situation is not a pleasant thing to watch. Um, but the him presenting his image in this way and then also some people in the media uh picking that up and running with it and um trying to sell us on this idea that this is some amazing act of nobility instead of him like holding on to the very last minute until there was no other choice uh when the noble thing to do would have been to step down with enough time for some alternative to emerge through the democratic process. Um, yeah, we shouldn't lose sight of that. Let well, me play one more. Yeah, I think the other thing that really comes to mind is like, how did the Democratic Party find themselves in this incredibly weak spot where there are a whole bunch of governors who could be viable contenders for the presidency at some point in the future? Um, sure. You know, Shapiro comes to mind, Whitmer comes to mind, um, Mark Kelly comes to mind. But the fact of the matter is there's really not an obvious person who has sort of what it takes to beat Trump. And, you know, even looking at Harris, it doesn't seem like the Biden administration particularly set her for success, something we were just talking about with Alex. Um, you know, the fact that she was sort of like shoved aside, seen as a threat to Biden's reelection chances shows that they really weren't anticipating this challenge and they really should have just done math on Biden's age and life expectancy and attempted to uh, secure sort of the future of the party uh, and the future, secure their legacy a little bit via Harris, but they chose not to do that. Like they made choices all the way down not to anticipate this very obvious problem. Absolutely. There's one more clip I want to play from his exit speech here, which is him projecting forward for these final six months or so what he hopes to accomplish as a lame duck. John, could you roll that? You know, there is a time and a place for long years of experience in public life. But there's also a time and a place for new voices, fresh voices, yes, younger voices. And that time and place is now. Right, right now. now. In the next moment. six months, I'll be focused on doing my job as president. That means I'll continue to lower costs for hardworking families, grow our economy, I'll keep defending our personal freedoms and our civil rights, from the right to vote to the right to choose. I'll keep calling out hate and extremism, make it clear there is no place, no place in America for political violence or any violence at ever, period. I'm going to keep, keep speaking out to protect our kids from gun violence, our planet from climate crisis that is the existential threat. And I will keep fighting my, for my cancer moonshot so we can end cancer as we know it because we can do it. And I'm going to call for Supreme Court reform because this is critical to our democracy, Supreme Court reform. Um, yeah, I, I, are you placing bets on Biden and ending cancer in the next six months? Well, um, the most the most challenging part of what he just said was the Supreme Court reform thing, yep. I think. Um, bad things lie that way, right? Because we currently have a, it, you know, a Supreme Court whose legitimacy is frequently challenged um, and increasingly seemingly challenged uh, by parts of the media and um, punditry uh, because I think in part it is comprised of a whole bunch of conservatives and they've uh, issued a few rulings that are extraordinarily unpopular. For example, the Dobbs abortion ruling, which overturned Roe v. Wade and returned the issue to the states. Um, you know, Biden has, you know, said some things about court packing in the past. I don't think that that is what he means this time. I think this time he's talking about uh, attempting to institute term limits and possibly some sort of enforceable code of ethics. But I don't think that it is a stretch to say that this is likely to be used in a very politically motivated way. Um, and, you know, I don't know whether we can bear that fight. And I think that, uh, an executive attempting to exert this control over the judiciary in such a manner is like possibly, you know, we're, we're getting into some really funky territory here. Yeah, what do you mean that I, part? Like, does it, does it concern you? 
It, it does. And I don't know exactly what he has in mind or even could feasibly accomplish at this point in terms of reforming the Supreme Court. Um, you know, obviously, the idea of packing the Supreme Court has been in the kind of fever dreams of the progressive left for a while now. Um, they haven't had the power to do that. I have no doubt that if they gained that power, if they gained uh, majorities or super majorities, whatever is needed to make that happen, that they they would do it. Uh, I'm skeptical that Biden um, is going to be able to accomplish much uh, in, in that regard. I do at this point view the Supreme Court as maybe the bulwark in the federal government against the attacks on our our liberties. Um, you know, Biden mentioned personal freedom in that answer. And I mean, the moment where he really lost me was in his attack on personal freedom by mandating across all private employers using uh, OSHA that you had to get the vaccine, you had to submit to testing in order to keep your job. And we're going to do this through an executive uh, health and safety agency. It was the Supreme Court that struck that down. Um, the Supreme Court that basically, you know, rolled back some of the excesses of COVID um, and that has been protecting everything from our gun rights to our religious liberties. Um, I don't agree with every decision that comes out of there, but um, I think that uh, from a libertarian perspective, the Supreme Court is something we want to um we we don't want it's becoming a, a tool of Kamala Harris or whoever uh comes next speaking of Kamala Harris he did uh mention at the beginning of that clip again that we need fresh ideas the time for ex experience is over the time for fresh ideas we need young has ideas finally and arrive. a 9 year old right <laughs> yeah Yes. So uh, let's turn now to a rally that Kamala Harris held. Uh, let's roll the first clip uh, from that where she talks about her record and why she's going to be a strong candidate, uh, you know, getting into this race 100 or so days before the election. Before I was elected vice president, before I was elected United States senator, I was elected attorney general of the state of California, and I was a courtroom prosecutor before them. And in those roles, I took on perpetrators of all kinds. Predators who abused women, fraudsters who ripped off consumers, cheaters who broke the rules for their own gain. So hear me when I say, I know Donald Trump's type. There you go. So yeah, she's embracing the cop mala image. Uh, I'm going to be a tough prosecutor and uh, I'm going against this convicted felon. How do you think that's going to work out for her, Liz? I mean, I think it'll work out better for her this time around than it did in 2020 when people, especially yeah. on the left, were notoriously sensitive to this. Um, you know, we all remember the sort of insane summer in which many American cities were on fire um, following the, you know, May 2020 killing uh, at the hands of cops uh, of George Floyd. And so, you know, at that time in progressive and democratic politics, uh, Kamala's record as a prosecutor played very terribly. I mean, there was also at that time, remember, a little bit more momentum around drug legalization efforts. Now we've sort of seen that wave crest in an interesting way. And now we're beginning to see crackdowns in places like New York on, um, you know, operators being in the sort of like gray market. Um, so we're beginning to see the drug war technically being rolled back, but then there's still being a whole bunch of cops dispatched to crack down on different places. We're also seeing a little bit of this like cultural backlash and people saying, I don't really like what's happening to my neighborhood or my, my city or my state following legalization. So I think on, you know, the, some of the drug policy stuff, Kamala Harris has notoriously been quite bad. That played terribly in 2020. That might play better in 2024. 
Um, and then also even with like some, you know, smaller things, like I know Elizabeth Nolan Brown at Reason has really dinged Kamala an awful lot in the past for her record uh, on cracking down on truant kids and their families. And the fact that time and time again, and also the back page prosecution, the role that Kamala played there, time and time again, Kamala has really shown to voters that she favors using the carceral state as much as possible in order to crack down uh, frequently on minorities and poor people. Uh, so I don't know, you know, whether that will play well uh, among progressives this yeah. time around, but boy, did it not go so well in 2020. Like she's not a very strong candidate. Yeah. I mean, it sort of doesn't matter how well it plays with progressives <laughs> because she has bypassed the primary process. Um, yeah. It matters more so, I guess. I, I mean, it matters to the degree that they're just like so mad about it that they stay home or vote for Jill Stein or Cornell West or something like that, or Chase Oliver. Um, but they are, you know, um, she, I, it matters to me because I don't trust prosecutors. And I think libertarians have good reason not to trust prosecutors. Um, yeah, we, what are you going to do now as a Biden voter, Zach? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I still I still got to think about that. Um, but the, you know, going down, I don't want to go down her record, you know, point by point, uh, because uh, I think that it's it's sort of a wash when you look at her up against Trump anyway, who's going they're just going to be kind of trying to outlaw and order each other, but just in from different angles. Um, but I, I do think that it's worth kind of reflecting on the reasons why prosecutors, especially ones that rise to the state AG of California level, are fundamentally untrustworthy. Um, and no one did that better than Tulsi Gabbard in the debate uh, dur during the, the primary debates when uh, Kamala ended up, I think, finishing below Andrew Yang in, in, at, at the end of the day. Um, can, I think we have that clip. Uh, John, could you just play the Gabbard versus Harris clip to refresh our memories? Congresswoman Gabbard, you took issue with Senator Harris confronting Vice President Biden at the last debate. You called it a, quote, false accusation that Joe Biden is a racist. What's your response? I want to bring the conversation back to the broken criminal justice system that is disproportionately negatively impacting black and brown people all across this country today. Now, Senator Harris says she's proud of her record as a prosecutor and that she'll be a prosecutor president, but I'm deeply concerned about this record. There are too many examples to cite, but she put over 1,500 people in jail for marijuana violations and then laughed about it when she was asked if she ever smoked marijuana. She blocked evidence. She blocked evidence that would have freed an innocent man from death row until the courts forced her to do so. She kept people in prison beyond their sentences to use them as cheap labor for the state of California. And she fought to keep cash you, bail system in place that impacts poor people in the worst kind of way. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Congressman. So, uh, by the way, so if you want to look into that specific case that uh, Tulsi is talking about there, uh, just Google Kevin Cooper, California. Um, and it's always disturbing to see someone who is on death row even though California doesn't actually execute many people, um, kind of get evidence withheld. And that's really explains like my fundamental distrust of prosecutors because they are tend to be willing to, you know, the bad ones tend to be do, willing to cut a lot of corners just to never take a loss or have to backtrack. Um, and where it concerns me, like thinking forward is like, what did Trump say when he came to the Libertarian National Convention and tried to make his pitch to libertarians? That the top of the demands there was, we want you to free Ross, um, uh, you know, offer a pardon for Ross Ulbricht. It's a lot harder to imagine a former prosecutor doing that, um, and she hasn't made given any indication that that's anywhere on her mind. Um, you know, we. I, I would just like to see some sort of outreach, similar outreach that has happened from the Trump side of the aisle, from the Harris side of the aisle. I know she's attending the Bitcoin conference coming up uh, 
again, color me skeptical given the, the general attitude that uh, Democratic Party has taken towards crypto and Bitcoin, but I'll, I'll take what I can get. Um, but yeah, just in, in terms of, of thinking forward, I guess I just wonder whether a former prosecutor is going to be able to think about offering offering the kinds of uh, reforms that, that a libertarian would, would want to see to the system. Um, well, I think we also have to consider, I mean, not only would she clearly be no gift to libertarians, right? If anything, on a lot of econ policy stuff, she is like sort of Biden, but a little bit further to the left, just consistently on basically every single issue that you can point to. So that isn't exactly yeah. thrilling to um, any of us. But I think the other thing to consider, which we have to take... Um, at the same time, as we sort of consider my point that I made before of like, she doesn't have a lot of appeal to the progressive wing of her party is also that she's played politics on easy mode. Uh, you're talking about her record as a prosecutor and within California politics. Okay. That means that she knows how to appeal to a very solidly blue state and frankly, um, sort of elite power players in major cities, mm -hmm. right? She had a long career in San Francisco politics. The fact of the matter is that what really matters in this election is her ability to win like six or seven swing states. And it remains to be seen whether she can sort of speak the, the language of those voters and appeal to them um, in any sort of way. And she frankly hasn't really proven herself to be a particularly strong, compelling candidate, let alone one that is able to escape that elite image and actually speak to the things that uh, you know, people living in Wisconsin care about. Uh, there's nothing about how Kamala presents herself or the issues that she makes front and center with perhaps the sole exception of being abortion, um, where I'm like, oh yeah, the way that you're talking about this will surely be compelling to a rural Pennsylvanian, right? Like there's, th that's really the thing that the Democrats have to be considering here. And Kamala just isn't the girl for that, I don't think. Well, there's another segment of the speech where she lays out some of her agenda or gives us a preview of what it is she will be running on. So let's play a little bit of that and see if any of that resonates. This campaign is not just about us versus Donald Trump. This campaign is about who we fight for. <laughs> We believe in a future where every person has the opportunity not just to get by, but to get ahead. A future where no child has to grow up in poverty. Where every worker has the freedom to join a union. It is uh, that sounds to me like the kind of usual laundry list of progressive um, uh, wish list items. The, you know, uh, basically, you know, she mentions uh, everyone should be more easily able to join a union, affordable health care, affordable child care, all of which imply to me, you know, federal programs to make those things more abundant. And I'm all for affordable health care and child care, but you know, you know, I, I want to see market-based reforms to make health care more more affordable. I want to see deregulation at the local and state level to make child care more affordable. There's a great reason uh, documentary that our colleague Justin Zuckerman made about why daycare is so damn expensive in DC. And then once you get out of DC to the uh, surrounding suburbs, it's for some reason uh, a much like you know uh, uh, thirty percent more affordable or something like that. And spoiler alert: it all has to do with the licensing around the childcare facilities and who can become a um, a daycare worker. So I mean, if if those were the solutions on the table, I'd I'd be all ears, but. I don't think that's exactly what Kamala has in mind. This is the MO of the Democrats, right? It's promise-free stuff and stuff that sounds really good, but 
you know, I wouldn't say that there's really much um, policy ingenuity in anything that Harris has proposed, either as vice president or even in the early stages of her presidential campaign. So I think it's very easy to get up on stage and say, you know, you really deserve paid family leave. You really deserve free childcare. And it's like, okay, but what is the the mechanism by which this will be delivered and or what are the second order impacts that whatever policy you put in place will have? Um, because fundamentally, like some of these issues are either intractable or involve trade-offs. Um, and that's really, there's, there's nothing particularly unique about what Kamala is peddling. And I don't even think there's very much sophisticated sort of like policy making um, that I'm anticipating from her team thus far. I would be happy to be proven wrong uh, because it's always so much better to sink our teeth into actual policy proposals and to explain why they are misguided um, versus attempting to just sort of focus on the boilerplate uh, in speeches and the tone, right? Like I would much prefer to be operating at the policy substance level, but unfortunately, um, frankly, neither Harris nor Trump have given us that much uh, in, yeah. in that regard. Yeah. And it be again, it being so delayed in the process where we're, you know, coming up on 100 days out from the election, mm -hmm. that just gives less and less time for an actual policy discussion. And everything is going to be about the theatrics, the horse race and all that. Um, hopefully, once the debates come around, some of that will be surfaced a little bit more. But we're kind of like sadly moving into like this post policy. I mean, maybe it's always been like we're in po politics is not about policy, but um, it's the it's astronaut like, meme where you're like, oh, it's post policy <laughs> oh, yes. behind you. Like it's always it, been post policy. Always has been. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, even the one bone that I threw out there with the uh, Bitcoin conference, uh, uh, Kamala expected to attend there. Our producer, John, now is telling me that, that she might not be speaking there. So, uh, even that is is fading away and crumbling beneath our feet. But uh, um, hope hopefully, um, you know, the kind of embrace of Bitcoin and crypto by uh, by uh, some high level politicians and particularly on one side of the aisle, I think, has been a kind of a, a big game changer and a sort of underrated like driver. Like people, uh, you know. Bitcoin holders, Bitcoin hodlers are not a, a huge voting block, but I think they're a passionate one because they're literally voting their wallet, their digital wallets here. So it's mm. that's that's been a kind of like bright spot that I've seen in um, our, our national politics. As of well, late. our and boy toy I, I RFK Jr. has very um, solidly yep. embraced Bitcoin. Um, I mean, you and I both saw his speech at the same Bitcoin conference last year. Uh, and I think that, you know, he attempted to sort of carve this out as his own. And then Vivek Ramaswamy, who um, I believe will be our episode for next week, uh, also, you know, spoke at the same conference and has been very aggressive about promoting Bitcoin. Um, but I mean, it's not really a shock that Harris uh, finds herself backing out of courting that vote. Yeah. And while we're lingering here on substantive policy conversations, let me bring up this tweet from Charlie X. <laughs> who tweeted that Kamala is brat. This is some sort of Gen Z, uh, ma major Gen Z development. You are much closer to understanding what the hell is going on with Gen Z than I am. So could you unpack this a little bit for us, Liz? Don't Wait. act like I didn't already explain it to you, um, but I will explain uh, to our viewers for their benefit. Uh, and I'm writing a, a piece on this to be published tomorrow for Reason Roundup, uh, which I write every morning and you can get delivered into your inbox if you know what's good for you. Um, but yeah, basically what we're seeing happening, the, the big picture political take here is that we are seeing a media manufactured phenomenon, essentially, where they are claiming that Harris is doing a damn good job of courting the youth vote. Um, you know, frequently when commentators talk about the youth vote, they always attach the whatever buzzy generational label they want to it. So this time it's Gen Z. Gen Z is actually, I believe, like 27 year olds down to like, you know, 15 year olds or 16 year olds, something along those lines. Um, you know, Charlie XCX herself is like 31 years old. I would say that the the album that she so so to back up a little bit. Charlie XCX is a pop sing singer who released, um, you know, a neon green uh, covered album called Brat. It's a lot of like party girl anthems, essentially, including some slightly odd references to Dime Square. And I don't want to call it like right wing provocateur discourse, but something somewhat adjacent to that. Um, mm -hmm. And so 
It's not as if Charlie. My favorite and song falls into that uh, <laughs> realm. Which by is, the way, which one is your favorite song? Tell it's the a, well, it's the it's the it's a da, it's the Dasha appreciation song, right? Can you so. explain who Dasha is to our viewers? <laughs> Uh, yes, D Dasha of the Red Scare podcast. Uh, she made us, uh, Charlie XX made a song called Mean Girls that is uh, allegedly, uh, I mean, I don't know how confirmed this is, but it seems to be a, uh, I a biographical it. song about the life of Dasha, like living it up in New York and kind of having a, a dead eyed uh, but intelligent stare. <laughs> Beautiful description. Um, but yeah, no, I think it's I think it's actually sort of worth highlighting, like underscoring the fact that Charlie XCX is not particularly the week. We have nothing to indicate that she's left wing or even supporting Kamala. She basically tweeted this right after Biden stepped down and endorsed Kamala. And what Brat essentially refers to, you know, the album and a lot of the themes uh expressed within the album is like sort of a um messy party girl who's a little bit overconfident and full of herself and sort of has, um, you know, like her shit together a little bit, but not totally. And mm -hmm. there's a little bit of um, like sort of absurdism, I would say, that's part of this. And so I can understand, you know, the the pop culture persona of Kamala Harris that has really taken hold is that of the kooky wine mom or wine aunt where she's just sort of like constantly saying things that are just like a little bit, she's like a little socially awkward, right? In the same way that people kind of roast Eric Adams, my mayor online for just like saying absolutely, like being caught in these really bizarre lies or having these sound bites that just, you know, they're an attempt to be cool, but in fact, they really end up falling flat. And, and Kamala has a lot of those things, you know, the now viral meme of like, you know, did you fall out of a coconut tree? And now coconuts have been, uh, you know, associated with Kamala Harris. And it was just her recounting like that. That was her recounting an anecdote. Her mother, I think, asking her whether she fell out of a coconut tree as a, as a little kid or something along those lines. Um, right. And but but people just like seize on these odd little Kamala lines and meme them to oblivion. Uh, the thing that I think is so absurd about all of this is that I would imagine Charlie XCX was just totally screwing around. It doesn't actually mm -hmm. in any way endorse Kamala or is that fired up about Democrats. Um, and two, it's just kind of like not a compliment at all, right? Being brat is not like being a sort of like messy party girl who puts her foot in her mouth a lot. Like that's not exactly what you're looking for in a presidential candidate, I don't think. Um, well, but, Gen Z might be. That's what that's what the stories have been is that yeah. now Kamala is the Gen Z candidate yeah. because she's brat. Yeah. Um, yeah. The stories have been really like, I think, but I think it's like more like media manufactured than anything because they mm. want an angle related to Kamala's campaign and they don't have any policy angles really. And we're getting a little sick of relitigating all of the a sort of bo boring sound bites and the tonal components. And so there's a little bit of a sense of like, we're, I think, scraping the bottom of the barrel, trying to find an angle here. Yeah. Um, I mean, I tried and, to, I tried to dig into the actual polling a little bit and there's been, v v I couldn't find any polling of specifically Gen Z. They like mm -hmm. lumped them together with the us cursed millennials um, mm -hmm. in this 18 to 34 demographic, well, you're uh, not which in I am out. I am outside of because I am an elder millennial. Um, but uh, this, uh, so this was the latest one I could find from CNN that mm -hmm. uh, occurred between July 22nd and 23rd, which was after uh, Kamala got the endorsement. And uh, you do see a little bit of a bump in that demographic going from 42 for the Democratic candidate, 42 percent for the Democratic candidate who was Biden at the time to now 47 for Harris versus 43 for Trump. Um, so that that's one sign of, you know, some excitement in, in the younger uh, demographic for for her. Before that, um, uh, uh, Quinnipiac asked uh, in, yeah. a, in a poll that was done um, in the days leading up to Biden exiting and like one day overlapping with his exit. So it's hard to pick this apart, but <clears throat> They asked if the election were being held today and the candidates were Kamala Harris and the, the Democrat and Donald Trump, the Republican, for whom would you vote? Trump actually beats Harris in that demographic 58 percent to 39 percent. So I get, you know, well, the, but the, the interesting is, thing about that poll specifically, though, is when they had run it 
um, back when Biden was still the nominee, um, you know, those halcyon days when we had our ailing elder statesman in charge. Um, now they're finding that Harris is per like performing a little bit worse with this voting demographic than Biden did just a few weeks ago. So I think that that's sort of the noteworthy thing. Like we're not seeing a conclusive, I mean, polling is never conclusive, but we're not seeing, um, any sort of theme emerging as to how Harris does with younger voters. We're kind of seeing data all over the place here. Yep. And I think the thing that I keep coming back to is, okay, it would be great if she can get out the youth vote. It would be great if she can be this galvanizing force that gets out the vote, like from a, from a political perspective, like, okay, great for her. The thing that matters though, is these swing states. Okay. So the, the thing that matters is not whether there are, you know, lefty, 20 year olds in New York who are excited to get out the vote for Kamala Harris. What matters is that those people exist in Wisconsin. And I don't know whether we have good evidence to indicate that these people are, you know, getting excited about her can candidacy. There's also the problem, which I think will be a huge liability, which is that within the Democratic Party, the issue of what's happening in um, specifically in Gaza with Israel's, um, you know, war and like ground incursion into Gaza following Hamas's October 7th attack. This has been something that has split a lot of the Democratic Party apart, but especially among young voters, right? We saw a few months ago, I believe in May, college campuses across the nation really exploding in these protests um, and administrators not knowing what to do, specifically having so many students who were coming out in support. I don't want to say in support of Hamas necessarily, though there were some elements of that, but certainly in support of the idea that there's uh, an you know egregious violation of human rights and a massive humanitarian crisis happening in Gaza, and that Israel has erred in their military tactics, um, and so this yeah. is something that like young people really care about right now. And Harris, there again, it's a little bit of a ginned up media phenomenon because there have been an awful lot of headlines lately that have said, well, Harris is a little tougher on Israel and expecting a little bit, you know, Netanyahu to to you know defend himself a little bit more than Biden did, and it's like, well. OK, so maybe Harris will take a tougher tack with Netanyahu and with Israel. But in reality, if you actually look at the advisors that she had been consulting with and who she is likely to appoint into foreign policy positions, they're pretty normal, mainstream folks, the likes of which we would expect in a Biden or Obama administration. So to act like the Harris stance on Israel would be a massive break with what has come before her, I think is totally um, a misreading. And I think it might even be an attempt to, I don't want to say it's like a conspiracy, but I wonder whether some of these headlines are put out there in an effort to try to convince young people who are galvanized by this issue that Harris is in fact their candidate and is in fact the good, you know, the good one on, on Gaza specifically. And like, yeah, I just don't have any evidence to indicate that that's true. Yeah. And when you think about the youth vote, um, you're right that this is not going to be the thing that's swinging any elections, especially when you're thinking about, you know, 25 and under specifically, they just don't have the numbers to do that. What it does indicate, what the, the, why the, that young vote is important is that this is the basis for a future political movement. I mean, Obama had this, um, and he, you know, he had a, he built a real movement that then has now since fallen apart since, you know, uh, the Trump uh, wrecking ball came through. Trump also now has built a MAGA movement, um, you know, uh, that we I saw it there when I was at the Republican National Convention and the energy that, you know, younger, you know, right wing MAGA type uh, guys and gals bring into that definitely is meaningful uh, in some way. Um, and now that he's, you know, tapped a youngish uh, successor in J.D. Vance, it seems like the MAGA movement is in some sense going to endure uh, past Trump um, in a way that whatever movement Obama was trying to build did not endure past him. When I think about Kamala Harris as the center of such a movement, I'll say I'm dubious or skeptical to say the least that she's going to be that kind of figure here within the 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 libertarian movement. 
We had our Ron Paul moment that excited a lot of young people and the well, movement amusingly that came was out. ancient at the time and is even more ancient today, right? That's right. But he that was part of his appeal at the time. Yeah. He was a like grandfatherly, like sort of looked at as a wise figure. He um, was coherent in a way that Biden is not at this moment. Um, and the effects of the Ron Paul movement are still with us today um, in, in the libertarian movement. So the it'll, Ron it'll be Paul movement is in the room with us right now. So. It, 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 it literally is. <laughs> um, and so, uh, the, you know, that that's uh, something that I don't see really coalescing around uh, Kamala Harris, whether, you know, she wins the election or not. I think I that think the circumstances are just not right for that. I think so many more things in American politics can be explained by board journalist looks for story angle. Like, I think that this is sort of like an underrated uh, phenomenon. Like some things are not actually happening. They are simply a journalist needs to, I don't know, like cover a quota of how many articles they turn on a week and they, or they are looking for just a new fresh angle, uh, you know, for the Kamala Harris campaign. And so they're looking into these things and I get it. Like you don't, you want to leave no stone unturned and what young people are thinking about in this election, I think, Sure, that's an important, relevant story, but there is a certain amount of this type of thing being just pretty ginned up, pretty manufactured. Like, it's not yeah. clear to me that this actually matters or that there will be any staying power here. This strikes me as a this week phenomenon, not a this election yeah. phenomenon. Yeah, and um, the, I think that's that's those are wise words for kind of analyzing the Kamala Harris phenomenon as a whole. Is we need to wait and see in a couple of weeks how enduring any of this is. Like, and in terms of journalists uh, ginning up stories, I think like one of the things also to be uh, on the lookout for, and maybe we can like finish uh, wrap this up with our thoughts on this, is because of Kamala Harris's identity as a woman, half black, half Indian, one of the media angles that's already starting to bubble up is that uh, kind of anyone who criticizes her or questions her path to this moment is kind of lumped into, um, are, are you being racist right now? Are you being sexist right now? Um, and to be sure, there are racists and sexists out there saying racist and sexist things about uh, uh, Kamala Harris in the same way that people were doing that about Obama when when he rose. But there was also legitimate criticism of Obama that people were opportunistically putting into that uh, basket. And I think anytime we've got someone who's, you know, on their uh, on the path to holding the most powerful office in the world, we need to be on guard against people kind of cynically exploiting those sorts of things to shut down criticism or ask questions in the same way it was verboten to ask questions about Joe Biden's age um, and condition. So um, that that's just another thing. I, I don't think it's like even reached its uh, zenith yet or even close, but I can already see it kind of percolating. Well, so many people are saying that Harris is a DEI candidate. And I think mm -hmm. that this is true. But the interesting thing about all of this is that, you know, now we've we've seen basically diversity, equity, and inclusion candidates uh, in all kinds of different industries, right? Like this has been a phenomenon of the last few years uh, where suddenly we see in corporate boardrooms all across America, there being quotas instituted or informal quotas instituted and DEI is a consideration uh, when trying to figure out who to hire, fire and promote. But the thing is in politics, we've had DEI candidates for a really long time. This has always been a consideration when attempting to figure out who should be ascendant within a party as well as who their running mate should be on a ticket. You know, mm -hmm. in politics, uh, any political strategist that you speak to, I think will be very candid about the fact that sometimes when there is a weakness of, you know, the, the president on a ticket, um, the presidential contender on a ticket, you're looking to balance that out in the vice president. The thing that was so interesting about the Trump Vance ticket is that Trump is so confident in his polling and in the likelihood of his winning that he chose to sort of eschew that. And instead of attempting to you know, secure a swing state, 
um, that's jeopardized, he chose a more uh, explicitly ideological pick in Vance. Vance is sort of seen mm -hmm. as, um, you know, MAGA ascendant, MAGA rising, uh, this economic, this, this right-wing populist um, who's beloved among the new right and sort of, you know, at the vanguard of this sort of like new iteration of the MAGA movement. Uh, of course, he comes with the added perk of having this Pennsylvania proximity by nature of being an Ohio guy. Um, and Pennsylvania is, of course, a critical swing state that Trump really wants to win, especially because when he was assessing this and picking a running mate, that looked like it would be, um, you know, totally Biden territory, like very, it would be a huge blow to Biden if Trump were to win it. Um, but it's a state that's absolutely critical and it's it's not clear where it will fall. Uh, but I think the thing that's interesting about this is that, you know, you're always considering the composition of a ticket. You're always considering balancing right. out um, the because billing. It's exciting of to be to have the first of of any group, um, and and there's nothing yeah. wrong with being excited about that. By the way, um, yeah, and, it's fine. Uh, it, I think that the thing people react to with sort of Kamala Harris's trajectory is the way that Biden just kind of so like ham fistedly, yeah. you know, put it out there. Like I will pick a person that is in this exact matrix instead of just saying, I'm going to pick a qualified person and, you know, women of color can be qualified. And this is why Kamala Harris is a great fit for this ticket. It was not ever presented that way. It was presented in this sort of gross reverse way that only a like aging um, kind of like old fashioned guy like uh, Biden could do. And he, he did this with Katanji Brown Jackson, his Supreme Court pick as well, right? Like he yeah. could be a little bit more sneaky with all of these things and leave <laughs> the quiet part unsaid. And it could be an internal matter that actually he's only considering black women. Uh, for his justices, for his vice presidential slot. But instead he feels the need, like that's where the Democratic Party, remember, like that's where the Democratic Party was when he was selecting Kamala Harris. Um, you know, they wanted, a, a lot of it at least wanted this sort of explicit pandering to like identity politics. And now it feels like the fever has broken and we've moved past that a little bit. But I think people on both sides of the aisle, like it, it would have just been a little bit uh, more smooth if he had had that as his quiet, secretive selection criteria, but had not chosen to make that public. And there's something very, I think, I think it's actually, I think at the end of the day, it's a little bit offensive to say that you are disqualifying a bunch of possibly, uh, you know, highly qualified people based off of immutable characteristics. Yeah. And it's also um, sort of putting the actual person who gets the job in an impossible position by sort of setting that up and and just making everyone hyper aware of it. Uh, and, uh, you know, you say the fever has broken. I guess that will, uh, in see. terms of like the uh, fixation on these things, I guess that's something we will also see in uh, the coming weeks and months. Um, we might be starting to get a, a temperature again. I, I don't know. And, and the fever's coming back. Uh, we'll We'll wait and see. But um, I really appreciate you breaking it all down with me this week, Liz. Um, you can always read Liz's work. Uh, every morning, you can get it in your inbox, the Reason Roundup. So please subscribe to that. Uh, you can see more of my work, including my recent coverage of the Republican National Convention at Reason TV. We will be back here, same place, same time next week. Thank you for tuning in. Thanks for listening to Just Asking Questions. These conversations appear on Reason's YouTube channel and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed every Thursday. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and please rate and review the show.